Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, today's video is about Atom Smashers. Subtitle, It's a Mechanical World. I've covered interactions over and over again because it is important. And I'm repeating this because not only is the particle model where the G1 and G2 particles interact with in three ways, as I've said over and over again, they can pass through, they hit and scatter or get trapped as an orbital. But there is another case, the case where the hits hard enough to split an atom or a molecule. How many cases have I described that are considered atom smashers? There are four videos, canal ray tube, electrolysis, fission, and CO2 scattering. Particle accelerators is probably what you are expecting to hear about, and I will talk about it a bit here in this video. But let's review the other four. Canal ray tubes, and I'm showing you the link to my video, emit the battery, emits uh, G1 particles, the G1, the uh, which is an electron, that is a G1 particle, hits a gas molecule, splits, splits it into a positive ion and an electron, and it continues on. So that we're splitting, we're smashing the gas atom in this particular uh, video. Next one is electrolysis. The uh, G1 particles are coming out the other way, uh, uh, hitting water with an electrolyte, and you can split the water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Another splitting. Electrolysis does electroplating, which is actually putting, the like painting uh, a copper on, onto a, a, a piece of metal, or it can clean off rust, and it's literally sand, like sandblasting the rust off when you're using G1 particles. Then there's fission, where a, a neutron is, is hit at an atom, the atom splits, and neutrons are emitted, and so on. F mechanically hitting and smashing and breaking up atoms. And the final one was CO2 scattering. Take, they, they shoot a CO2 uh, molecule real fast at a surface. Some of them just bounce off. The rest of them split up in certain ways. They're smashing the CO2 just by literally throwing it against a wall. D different ways of smashing atoms. Well, I'm going to talk briefly today about accelerators. Now, I'm not an expert in particle accelerators. My main point, it is an atom smasher, just like the other four I just mentioned. But we'll cover a few points that you might find interesting. So I'm going to talk about a linear accelerator from Wikipedia, and it states a linear Linear particle accelerator, often shortened to LINAC, is, or LINAC, is a type of particle accelerator that accelerates charged subatomic particles or ions to high speed by subjecting them to a series of oscillating electric potentials along a linear baseline. So they talk about charged subatomic particles which I assume are electrons and protons uh, and other ions, uh, but up to high speed. Well, they don't accelerate neutrons in a particle accelerator, uh, but they have their own device. Uh, just as a point of interest, again, Wikipedia, neutron generators are source Neutron source devices which contain compact linear particle accelerators. Apparently inside here is, I haven't looked into it much, but and that pr produces neutrons by fusing 
isotopes of hydrogen together. This is not the fission where you hit a, uh, take a, a, nuclei, a, a neutron and, and use it to smash. Maybe this is what they use it to smash the uh, isotopes that uh, I talked about earlier. The fusion reactions take place in these devices by accelerating either deuterium or tritium, which is a result of fusion or a mixture of these two, and it goes on and explains it. But interestingly enough, this is a neutron generator. Well, how fast do they really go? Well, here's, this is from Interesting Engineering, uh, which states the Large Hadron Collider is capable of accelerating particles upwards of 99.999 999% of the speed of light, or that value. Now, I get very suspicious when we can determine the speed of a particle in a particle accelerator at that speed. Now, I, did, I didn't repeat a, a, a slide for this, but uh, I've on a video on how they determine the mass of an electron. And in that video, there's a picture of, of, uh, of this a device that gets them uh, an electron stream moving in a perfect circle, and they measure the radius of the circle. And then they do some calculations, and they end up determining the mass of the electron and the velocity of the electron, the speed. Well, when they do that, uh, they don't state this kind of accuracy. I, 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 she, she, the lady in the video didn't give those kinds of numbers. So I'm a little bit suspicious of that being that accurate. Plus, I think it's a calculation, not a measurement. My opinion at this point, and I could be wrong, but I don't think they're measuring. I think they're calculating it from the value of the energy put into it. But they are bending the rules since, the, since first described as the universal limit. Physicists have since discovered special entities, some special particles that can reach superluminal, that is, faster than light speeds, which still abide by the universal rules set by special relativity. Now, I'm being rather critical here, but it seems to me that <coughs> If you use the equations that this lady used to do the mass and velocity of the electron in the, that her device, and you use special relativity to do this calculation, yeah, it abides because you use special relativity to explain mass increase and the rest of it and so on but they go faster than light. I, I don't, I'd love to see the calculations that uses special relativity and still gets an answer faster than the speed of light. I could be totally wrong here, but it certainly bears looking into. Well, here's a diagram of accelerator, again from Wikipedia, and this it's actually a, a, a video that you watch when you open up the link to uh, Wikipedia, and they have a source emitting uh, this red particle, and uh, they have a uh, generator that generates an AC voltage, uh, which it's a radio frequency voltage of a very high potential, thousands of volts, which is applied to these cylinders. Okay, and, and what, what happens is that you got a negative applied voltage here and a positive here, a negative and a positive. And this particle sitting here, if it's a proton, it's going to be attracted to the cylinder. Once it's past that cylinder, there is going to be a force. <laughs> There's an electric force. Their own model for electric force is from plus to minus. There's going to be a force in this direction, and if this is a proton, it's going to push it back. But the the principle is that it that for example, when the, if this were an electron, if it got to here, 
uh, even though the force in this direction, they, they talk about the fact that it moves, it causes it to move that way, which is a rule I, 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 I really can't understand, but uh, an electric force from here to here causes the electron to accelerate this way. When it gets to the, uh, uh, this point here, it changes. They change the polarity. They make this negative, then this positive, and again it accelerates. And when it gets to here, they change it again, and they make this uh, positive, and, and, and it accelerates. So uh, by alternating this at the right speed, uh, these cylinders are different lengths. Presumably, that because it's going, if it's going faster, uh, it's going to be go a further distance before they uh, would need to change. So the cylinders are, are probably larger for to match the speed. That's kind of that's how they they uh, do it. Now the question I found, I found, I puddle around on the internet looking for certain things and I find some very interesting uh, answers from Yahoo in this case. I don't know who this guy is, but he states, I worked at a particle accelerator for four years. I know their ins and outs pretty well. Sounds like your common worker there who's bragging about what his, that he worked there and uh, I, I don't think a, uh, a Dr. Kelsey, who we interviewed at the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator, would introduce himself that way. Uh, but this guy goes on to talk about the highest energy electrons produced at SLAC, so that's the Stanford Linear Accelerator, is 50 giga electron volts, which is about, now see, there's the clue, 50 giga electron volts, which is about, there's that same number with nine, six decimal digits because of this voltage. It's this section. It seems like a, a calculation. By the way, if you ever watch David's video documentary, uh, Einstein Wrong the Miracle Year, you will see my wife interviewing Dr. Kelsey on a hill as we're looking down at the, uh, the linear accelerator. I'm there, I'm the boom boom guy in that particular one. David's the, uh, got the camera and we're videoing the interview that my wife is doing for, with Dr. Kelsey. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But at Fermi Lab, they have a, an accelerator that can get up to tera electron volts. And this guy says, I don't know the exact number, but this can essentially podcast? This is essentially the speed of light. Uh, this okay. here's speed lighting. Welcome to the speed lighting. I, uh, I need to took a, take Alexa lights. off. She's answering my question here. Have a nice day. At such high energies acceleration accelerating doesn't really cause an increase in speed. Wow, we have an accelerator that doesn't accelerate. <laughs> I'm not sure this guy realized the contradictions he's making here, but as the but his reason is as the particles are at high energy at the high energy relativistic limit. I'm interpreting his statement as meaning when the particles initially accelerate, it is under the force of 50 giga electron volts and therefore is already moving at speed C. But uh, instead of accelerating the par particle, you can think of it uh, that they just get heavier as you accelerate them, but they are still traveling almost at the speed of light. This is one of those that <laughs> you really got to be guarded and, 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 and wonder what this guy is really saying. On the other hand, it's a, it's a interesting comments that he's making. It's, a, it's just amazing to me. By the way, he says that you, they get heavier. Dr. Kelsey, in that interview with my wife, claimed absolutely that mass increase did not happen. A, a highlight of that interview. 
Anyway, so what are the results of OR smashing, not S smashing? But anyway, uh, it's a fairly brutal way of taking matter to pieces. Uh, but it produces results. Instead of three or four fundamental particles, comparatively familiar objects like electrons and protons, the physicists are now talking about 25 or 30 particles, not just three or four. But some of them behave very strangely. So they have more peculiar properties and only exist for minute fractions of a second before turning into something else. There's a group called for this reason, the strange particles. And the strangeness itself is now being spoken as a property, like the electric charge is a property, which can be added or subtracted or leaked away or whatever strangeness could be modified apparently. Oh, and here they are. Instead of the standard model, I decided to I'll call it the strange model. And there are 30 particles. There's seven across, four down for 28, 29, 30 particles. There's an electron, but no proton, no neutron. In prior video, when I did some, I forget which one it is, uh, they explained that the up and the down particle are used in combinations of three to make the proton and the neutron. So it's not there because they now have a, a subatomic particle that's lower than these particles. At any rate, they have 30. Well, the particle model, I called it the particle model, we have uh, three particles, maybe four or five. Uh, at level one, we have the G1 and the N1 particle, which is like the nucleon at the nucleus and the, like the electron as an orbital. And G2 gravity holds them together, making all the atoms in our periodic table. Our solar system is held together by G1 gravity, G2 gravity holds atoms together. Don't have, we have indirect evidence of, in my opinion, this is my opinion, we have indirect evidence of these three, but it, it implies, the model implies there should be an N2 in order to make subatomic atoms, but we don't have uh, evidence of this, it's a, uh, suggestion that you have to have these atoms in order to have a very high speed G2 particle that does what the model says it does. And in order to have these atoms, you got to have a, a gravity that, that generates and holds those together, which would be G3. But those three are, are, are they're, they're predicted by the model. There's no evidence of them. Okay, so I'm paraphrasing a statement made by people that uh, at the end of the world, the guy who has most toys is the winner. Well, when the world ends, the one with the most particles wins. And, and uh, in this contest, we're losing. Uh, in a different way, we're winning. Well, now how does the particle model work with the accelerator? Well. Uh, if you're going to generate this alternating voltage, low, high, low, high, uh, you got a, a, a positive uh, uh, charge here and a negative. Well, when you the negative means there's lots of G1 particles here, very few G1 particles here, which sets up an F2 force in this direction. And at the very same time, there's an F2 force in that direction and an F2 force in this direction. Wow, you have alternating at any instant of time, at this point of time when this wave is that way, the particle is being subjected to alternate forces, slowing them up and speeding them up and slowing them down. The net F2 force is, uh, is squared, not, it's supposed to be squared, 
That's my estimate of the speed. No way to know exactly what the speed of the G2 particle is and hence the net, uh, the speed of this net force here. But uh, uh, C to the pants estimate is C squared. The accelerator will move any TPM particle, protons, neutrons, it'll, it'll propel them in that direction but not at a constant speed. And, and you can see why maybe there are some particles that uh, special entities, I don't know what they are, that go to superluminal speed because we have a pushing force here that is it's a high, very high power of, uh, of force that's causing them to speed up as well as slow down. Okay, the conclusion for this particular video is that it's a mechanical world. Most of the examples that you see with electrolysis use a battery that generates a stream of high intensity G1 particles to break atoms apart, smash them. Others use nucleons to break atoms apart and cause a chain reaction. Still others throw the object at a wall, CO2, and break it apart. And accelerators use particles to break atoms. Yes, indeed. It's a mechanical process, and the TPM model is a mechanical model. My name is Bobby Hilster, and I am your particle model guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the particle model. Thank you for your attention.